part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Full 40 College Basketball Podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. My name is Ben Billman, and I will be the host moving forward of the Full 40 College Basketball Podcast. I'm really excited to get this going. We are already a couple weeks into the season. It's been a great start to the season. Lots of upsets, lots going on, and I think there's a lot to talk about today. We're about a week out from all the Thanksgiving tournaments, and there was a huge shakeup in the top 25 after those. There are four teams that I want to touch on that I really feel like took the biggest jumps after the Thanksgiving tournaments. And it's been really impressive with some of these teams to see how they've done it. Uh, First of all, let's talk about Purdue. Uh, Purdue entered in to the Maui Invitational last week as the number two team in the country. And the Maui Invitational was absolutely loaded with teams. You had Purdue, Marquette, Kansas, Tennessee, three of the top 10 teams, or four of the top 10 teams in the country. Um, And three really top five teams in the country. And so it was a wild tournament. Lots of good games, uh, lots of good competition. In the end, Purdue won the Maui Invitational. They beat Tennessee in the Final Four. And then Marquette in a classic game in the championship. I think you've got to look at Zach Eady as the early contender for Player of the Year. He won it last year, and it wouldn't surprise me if he wins it again the way that he is playing. But Purdue, after being at number two, They win the Maui, and they move up to number one. I have no problems with that. I think they're the best team in the country. They're a year older. Their guards are now sophomores. And Matt Painter is right where he needs to be with this team. They look like a team that is Final Four or bust at this point in the season. Um, So very impressive finish for Purdue at the Maui Invitational. Another Thanksgiving tournament that turned out to be very good was the battle for Atlantis. Villanova ended up taking the battle for Atlantis. I had some serious questions about Villanova coming into this year, and they answered a lot of those with this battle for Atlantis championship. Villanova now falls 18th in the country. I think that's about right, uh, but they're a team to keep an eye on. When the Big East season gets closer, Connecticut looks like the best team in the Big East, But Villanova looks like one that could finish second or third. And after the Thanksgiving tournament win, I'm keeping an eye on Villanova. Lots of talent, lots of experience. And we know Villanova as a program is going to be successful come tournament time. Uh, So that's the second team that really took a jump and really looked impressive last week in the Thanksgiving tournaments. And... Thirdly, another champion of another tournament, the ESPN Events Invitational. Florida Atlantic won that tournament. They jumped up to number 13 after winning that tournament, and it wouldn't surprise me to see this team continue to gain in the rankings, especially once they move into conference play. Again, just like Villanova, I had some questions about Florida Atlantic. They made that magical run to the Final Four last year. Uh, You may all remember them losing to San Diego State on that buzzer beater in the Final Four. And I really wasn't sure what to think of Florida Atlantic coming into this season. Could they be at that same level? Could they maintain that level of consistency and play? And so far this season, they've proven that they can. Florida Atlantic looks like a team that is going to be there at the end of this season as well. 
and they were very impressive over the break. And I think they're a team that's going to continue to rise in the rankings. So those three teams, Purdue, Villanova, and Florida Atlantic, all won their tournaments over Thanksgiving break. There was one team, though, that did not win a tournament, but still looked very impressive, and that was Marquette. Marquette looks like another team. If the tournament started right now, I would probably put Marquette as a number one seed. They made it to the championship of the Maui Invitational. They beat Kansas in that semifinal. Kansas was number one at the time. They have since fallen to number five. And Marquette handled them. Let's just be honest. Marquette looked like the better team in that game. And Shaka Smart is doing a great job with that program. They were right there last year, uh, slipped up in the second round. It looks like this year they're better. Right now they sit at number three. And in that Maui Invitational Championship, they took Purdue down to the last possession. Marquette ended up finishing second. But I'll tell you what, that Purdue-Marquette matchup, it wouldn't surprise me if we saw a rematch in the national championship. So those are the four teams that over the last week or so were very impressive. And those are teams to keep an eye on. A couple teams that make me a little bit nervous right now. Uh, first of all, Kansas. Yes, Kansas did make third place in the Maui Invitational. I think they're still going to be right there as a one seed potentially when we get to tournament time. But when we look at the makeup of that team, they did bring in Hunter Dickinson, who, along with Zach Eady, is probably going to be in that National Player of the Year discussion at the end of the season. It still worries me with Kansas, with just the consistent play, the consistent shooting. And I know Bill Self is a great coach. He's going to have them there. But we have to remember that the Big 12 is one of the toughest conferences, if not the toughest conference in college basketball. Don't forget that the Big 12 has expanded. Now Houston is in the Big 12. Of course, Texas is in there still. BYU is now in the Big 12. There is a lot of talent and talented teams in the Big 12 now, and I think that does not bode well for Kansas. I think they're going to take a couple more losses in conference play. Yes, they're still a great team, but I'm a little worried after seeing that loss to Marquette that they're struggling just a little bit. At least it's at the right time before they get to conference play. Another team that worries me is Tennessee. Uh, I live in Knoxville, so I see Tennessee firsthand. They played the number two and the number one teams back-to-back -back in Purdue and Kansas in the Maui Invitational. But if they're not hitting shots, they look like a team that could fall quickly in a lot of different games. Add on to that that the SEC is a pretty deep conference this year, and Tennessee could struggle to get some wins. Again, I still see Tennessee as a team that's going to finish in the top 10, top 15 in the country. Uh, but some of their play so far has been a little bit shaky. And again, if they're not hitting three-pointers, they're not going to succeed. So those are some of the teams, Kansas and Tennessee, that I'm a little bit worried about um, moving forward. When you look at the AP top 25, it's very hard to determine what the people making these polls were really thinking because you look at others receiving votes. There were over 15 teams in the others receiving votes category, which means that those last few spots in the top 25 were very, very confusing and hard to determine. These next couple weeks leading up to conference play, I think will we'll be able to figure it out a little bit more. But there are a lot of good teams out there right now, and it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy to determine that 15 to 25 uh, ranking, and there are a lot of teams that are competing for that. 
One team that I'm very interested about seeing moving forward is Michigan State. They have fallen out of the top 25. They are still 25th in the coaches poll, hanging on barely. But in the AP poll, they only received 57 votes, and they are 31st if you extended it out past the top 25. Again, I'm not worried about Tom Izzo. I think he'll have that team ready by March. But it's just surprising that a team that started literally in the top 10 and had Big Ten championship aspirations is now sitting outside of the top 25. They're definitely going to be a team to keep an eye on as we move forward. The other thing that I like to look at early in the season, too, are mid-majors. Which mid-major teams could surprise come March? I've seen a couple teams rise up to an extent that if you were going to fill out a bracket today, these would be the Cinderella's that could potentially make it to the Sweet 16 and have that type of play that backs it up. Some of those teams, of course, Florida Atlantic, like I touched on earlier, I still consider them a mid-major. They had that success last year, uh, but they don't have uh, the type of program uh, like the Power 5 do or the Power 6 in college basketball when you include the Big East. So Florida Atlantic still is going to be a nightmare scenario for a lot of teams and tournaments. I also look at Colorado State. Now, Colorado State is in the Mountain West, so they're not necessarily a mid-major, but they are a team that has not had much success as of recently. Right now they sit at number 20 in the rankings, San Diego State came out of the Mountain West last year and made it all the way to the national championship. Colorado State might be that team this year to copy that mold and make it from the Mountain West all the way to the Final Four. They're another mid-major to keep an eye on. And it's pretty incredible what's going on at James Madison right now. James Madison, they finish 11-1 and in college football. Now their basketball team, 6-0 and to start the season, number 22 in the country. They've got some, something's going on there at James Madison. I don't know exactly what it is, uh, but they've got something going there. And again, it wouldn't surprise me if they're in a situation in the tournament where they get an upset or two moving forward. Those are some of the teams to keep an eye on. Outside of the 20, top 25, like I mentioned, Michigan State is a team to keep an eye on. Another team would be Princeton. We saw Princeton last year make it to the Sweet 16. Could they make another run to the Sweet 16 or beyond? Another team that has had success in recent years is Arkansas. Arkansas is right on the cusp as well of the 20, top 25, and the SEC overall is a very deep conference. Could Arkansas move into the top 25 and battle for an SEC title? We also see Nebraska, one of the teams in the Big Ten that in recent years under Fred Hoiberg has looked, let's just be honest, they've looked terrible. When people have put together the rankings from 1 to 14 in the Big Ten the last few years, Nebraska has consistently been at the bottom of that list. Now they have a team that looks like they can make a push in the Big Ten, get out of that bottom half, and compete in the top half of the Big Ten. So keep an eye on Nebraska as well. As we look at conferences overall, I think it's important to figure out not just which teams are on the rise, but also with which conferences are on the rise. And right now, if I was going to pick a conference that is above all others, I'd have to go with the Big 12. Uh, the Big 12 right now, as I mentioned with Kansas, it's going to be so difficult to um, pull away from the rest of the pile uh, when it comes to the Big 12. 
like I mentioned, Kansas, who right now sits at number five. Houston, the new member of the Big 12, sits at number six. Baylor sits at number nine. And then we have Texas, who sits at number 16. So four of the top 16 teams in the country are in the Big 12. Oklahoma snuck into the rankings this week at number 25. And don't forget about teams like Iowa State, Texas Tech. Forgot to mention BYU at number 19. TCU, Cincinnati, Kansas State, West Virginia. There is not going to be an off night in the Big 12. Obviously, that helps their strength of schedule, but it's also going to add a couple losses to their resumes that could hurt when it comes to seeding on Selection Sunday. So we'll keep an eye on the Big 12 moving forward. The other conference that I think is at the top of the pile uh, when it comes to the Big Six conferences is the Big East. Obviously, Connecticut, the reigning national champion, sits at number four right now. Marquette, like I talked about a little bit earlier, who had the great run in Maui and looks like a team that could create some chaos and could win the Big East as well, is at number four. And don't forget about Creighton. They haven't gotten off to the best start, but again, they made the Elite Eight last year. It would not surprise me to see them get back to that level again. They sit at number 15. Some other teams to keep an eye on in the Big East. Seton Hall, Providence, Xavier. We already talked about Villanova. And a team that confuses me right now is St. John's. Uh, Rick Pitino, the new coach there. Legendary Hall of Famer has uh, won a championship at Kentucky, won a championship that was then vacated at Louisville. Now he's at St. John's, and there's a lot of interest in that program as to where they can head moving forward. But the Big East is definitely a conference to keep an eye on. Big 12 and Big East, I would put number one and number two if I were making power rankings of the conferences. And then finally, number three, I'd put the SEC. Kentucky would be my top team right now in the SEC. They have a lot of young talent. You can't count out John Calipari. We mentioned Tennessee, Alabama, Arkansas. Mississippi State is in the top 25 at number 21. Texas A&M is at the top 25 at number 14. Auburn, Arkansas, there are a lot of teams to keep an eye on in the SEC. I don't necessarily see national title contenders in that group, in that conference, but there are a lot of teams that could make a push for the Final Four if they get hot at the right time. The other Power Six conferences, which I think have some work to do when it comes to the depth of the conferences, I think the Big Ten has a lot of talented teams, But other than Purdue, I'm just not sure if there's other teams in there that can make a push uh, for national rankings and national relevance. The ACC, Duke looks incredible. I think they're a team that's going to be very solid. Other than Duke, though, where are you looking for title contenders? Maybe Miami. Miami sits at number eight right now. They could be one of those teams, again, made the Final Four last year. Jim Laranaga does a great job in March. Virginia, Clemson, North Carolina, I still have a lot of questions about those. And then after that, I'm just not sure. Not sure what the ACC brings to the table. And then finally, the Pac-12. I don't know if I would say the worst of the Power Six, but the most confusing and the most unknown at this point, other than Arizona. Arizona, again, they went to Cameron Indoor Stadium earlier this year, got the win at Duke. So Arizona looks like a team that is going to be a force to be reckoned with. They sit at number two in the AP poll right now. There are a handful of teams that, again, I'm still not sure on. UCLA, Oregon. Colorado, USC, 
Those teams have talent, but are they going to maintain in the Pac-12? And again, don't forget, this is the last year of the Pac-12. After this season, there's a lot of movement that's going to happen, and it's going to be very interesting to see where those teams go after this season when they enter their new conferences. All right, let's take a quick break, and then I'll be right back with some more. Hey everybody, it's Sam Amico from Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Be sure to give us a listen for all your Cleveland Cavaliers recaps, analysis, breakdowns, draft talk, free agency. The list goes on and on. Give us a listen, Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. What's up everyone? I'm Holly Wetzel. And I'm Tigers Powell. And we are your hosts of the Orange is Oranger, a Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. We give you all the dog pound coverage that you'll need to get you through the regular season, hopeful postseason, and I'd say off-season, Tyvis, but is there really ever an off-season for this team? Thankfully for our podcast, Holly, there really never is when it comes to the Cleveland Browns. Don't miss our breakdown of each week's matchup, game recaps, and any and all news out of Berea to feed your Browns appetite. As we know, Holly, dogs gotta eat. Yes, they do. So hit that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the Orange is Orange, Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. All right, welcome back to the second half of the Full 40 College Basketball Podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. So what I want to do in the second half today is a discussion that brings up a lot of arguments in the world of college basketball, and that is the idea of Blue Bloods. We heard a lot about it at the end of last year, Connecticut winning their fifth national championship and if they should be considered a blue blood now that they have five are they a team that should be part of that list so i want to look at some teams that i believe are blue blood and then also three things that i think a team needs to have in order to be considered a blue blood program so let's look at the first category that i think needs to be in place for a team to be considered a blue blood. The first thing would be multiple national championships. If a team is going to be considered a blue blood, it can't just be a one year thing. It's gotta be something where a team has reached the pinnacle, the mountaintop of the NCAA at least twice. So immediately that cuts down our list drastically. Let me list off the teams that have won multiple national championships. UCLA, Kentucky, North Carolina, Duke, Connecticut, Indiana, Kansas, Villanova, Louisville, Cincinnati, Florida, Michigan State, NC State, Oklahoma State, and San Francisco. So if you don't hear your team on that list, it's because they've either only won one national championship or zero. And that right there is the first elimination factor for me. The second elimination factor that I believe you have to have in order to be considered a blue blood is that you have been relevant recently. And by recently, I mean in the last five to 10 years that you have reached some sort of success, not necessarily a national champion, not necessarily even a Final Four, but you are considered a team that within the past five to 10 years has been relevant at a national level. Games are being broadcast, you're getting to the second weekend of the tournament, top 10, top 15 in the country, not every year, but most years. And so because of that, there are a couple teams that I will eliminate immediately. First of all, San Francisco. They have not been relevant since the 50s. Uh, Bill Russell played on two national championship teams in 1955 and 1956. Recently, I couldn't even tell you who's played on those teams, how they've done. They're out of contention. Second one I would put in that list is Oklahoma State. 
they really have been a non-factor in the Big 12 in recent years. The last time they made a Final Four was in 2004, which seems like an eternity ago. That's 19 years, almost 20 years ago. Since then, they've been okay some years, but not very much. Their two championships came in 1945 and 1946, when they were actually called Oklahoma A&M. So I'm going to eliminate Oklahoma State from the Blue Blood list, even though they do have two national championships. The third team I'm going to eliminate from that list is North Carolina State. Their two championships came in 74 and 83. And again, they're a team that has become just kind of a has-been the last 15, 20 years. They've been fine, but when you look at the state of North Carolina, Duke and North Carolina have dominated that that state. NC State has become an afterthought. So I'm going to eliminate them, even though they do have two national championships. Another team would be Florida. Florida is a tricky one because they have had some good years. They did win the national championships in 06 and 07. They did make it to the 2013 Final Four. Um, excuse me, the 2014 Final Four. Uh, but since then, they really have not been that relevant. Billy Donovan left for the NBA, and they've been middle in the pack, middle of the pack in the SEC ever since. They've struggled to find their footing in the top 25. And because of that, I'm going to eliminate Florida. Now, if Billy Donovan would have stayed there, made it to a couple more Final Fours, maybe won another national championship, I might consider them a blue blood, but since he left, they've fallen out. And then finally, Cincinnati. Cincinnati has been a good program as of late, but they have not reached the heights that they did in the early 60s when they won championships in 61 and 62. Those teams were very good. Oscar Robertson obviously was on those teams. And they really were a dominant program back in that era. But recently, they just have not been at the same level. Bob Huggins did a really good job in the 90s and early 2000s. Mick Cronin had some success, but never tournament success with Cincinnati. And so I would eliminate them from the blue blood picture as well. And then finally, and this one might be kind of controversial, is Louisville. I'm going to eliminate Louisville from the blue blood discussion. Yes, they won a championship in 2013, but it was later vacated due to NCAA sanctions and penalties. So I'm going to pretend like that championship never happened and it really throws into question everything that they accomplished during the Rick Pitino era there at Louisville. Let's just pretend that the Rick Pitino era never existed, especially in 2012 and 2013 when they made back-to-back -back Final Fours. What else does that program really have to show over the last 15 to 20 years? And I would say last year and this year, Louisville might be one of the worst power six teams in the six major conferences. They just look terrible, and I don't know what the future is for that program. So I'm going to eliminate Louisville as well based on the relevant recently category. So multiple national titles, relevant recently, and then the third qualification to be considered a blue blood is that you have top tier recruiting and or top tier transfer recruiting. What are some of the things that go into this? Well, first of all, that you're able to recruit five star, four star type players, that those players in some cases go on to have success in the NBA, but also in order to get those recruits, you have to have facilities that are at a high level. Nowadays, with NIL money, you've got to be able to provide that money with donors and booster money and local business money. 
And so you're able to attract those recruits based on your history, your tradition, your recent success, your facilities, and the NIL money that you can provide to those athletes. And so there are, in my opinion, nine programs that I would consider blue blood programs. And I'm going to list those off to you now in no particular order because I think it's too hard to try to rank these teams with so much history and uh, so many ways that you could categorize these teams. First of all, I would put UCLA in there. They have the most national championships at all time with 11. They have the most legendary coach of all time in John Wooden. He won 10 of those 11 national championships with the other one coming in 1995. It was a weird season, but you might remember in 2021, UCLA made it all the way to the Final Four before losing on a buzzer beater by Jalen Suggs of Gonzaga in that Final Four. So they do have the relevancy recently. You also might remember Lonzo Ball and the run they had under Steve Alford. He had a couple good years there before they moved on to Mick Cronin. But UCLA from... The early 60s through the 70s, when they had the O'Bannon brothers in the 90s, and more recently making it to the Final Four in 2021, UCLA has maintained their success and been relevant the whole time. UCLA is definitely a blue blood, and even though it's been almost 30 years since they won a national championship, they still carry a big name in college basketball. Next up, I'd have Kentucky. Kentucky has eight national championships, the most recently in 2012 with Anthony Davis leading the way. But they have made multiple Final Fours under John Calipari, and they probably had the best team never to win a national championship in 2015, the team that entered the Final Four undefeated before losing to Wisconsin. Kentucky is a program that from the very start of college basketball back in the 30s and 40s has been a dominant program. And it doesn't matter who the coach has been or the era. They recruit at a high level. John Calipari has continued that to this day with all the one-and-done players. And if you see their facilities, the dorms, the, the uh, practice facilities, maybe the best in the country when it comes to college basketball. Kentucky deserves to be a blue blood, and we'll see where John Calipari takes them in the next couple years. They have had a little dip in success the last few years, but still, every single year, they're a national title contender. The third out of nine teams that I have on the blue blood list would be North Carolina. North Carolina has six national championships, two of the more famous coaches in college basketball history, Dean Smith with two of those championships, Roy Williams with three of those. The big question now becomes with North Carolina, Roy Williams retired just a couple years ago. Hubert Davis has taken over, still recruited a high level, still a team that you can't count out any year. But last year, 2022, they started as the number one team in the country and they failed to make it to the NCAA tournament. Still, though, North Carolina is a Final Four threat every single year. Plenty of players that play in the NBA. Their last title came in 2017, and you might remember the year previous in 2016, Chris Jenkins and Villanova beating them at the buzzer in the national championship. We'll talk about Villanova here in just a little bit as well. The fourth team I have as Blue Blood is Duke. Under Coach K, Mike Krzyzewski, five national championships, some of the best players in college basketball history, some of the most memorable moments in college basketball history. Five titles in 91, 92, 01, 2010, and 2015, and a Final Four in Coach K's last year in 2022. Uh, losing to their rival North Carolina in that game in the Final Four. But under Coach K, they have been a dominant program. John Shire took over last year. 
it's going to be super interesting to see where Shire takes them in the future. They have one of the best recruiting classes coming in next year. And again, ACC titles, Final Fours, National Championships, Duke has earned that Blue Blood title. Okay, fifth on this list, Connecticut. Connecticut is a team that up until Jim Beheim, excuse me, up until Jim Calhoun took over in the late 80s, they have been a dominant program. Jim Calhoun won four, excuse me, Jim Calhoun won three national titles in 99, 04, and 2011. After that, they've won two titles with Kevin Ollie in 2014, and then last year, Coach Hurley in 2023. They have been one of the most consistent programs during that time period, and I would put Connecticut in there even though their first championship came just 24 years ago. Next on the list, I would put Indiana. Indiana, five national championships. The tricky part with Indiana is that their last championship happened 36 years ago. At this point, we're reaching a moment where most people cannot remember a time when Indiana had a national champion contender every single year. When Bob Knight was fired in 2000, there was definitely a shift in the program. Now, they have still been relevant in a few years over the last 20, 22, 23 years. They have definitely fallen off, though. And I think a lot of people, because of that, have taken them off of the Blue Blood list. I just can't do that. When you had the undefeated team in 76, Isaiah Thomas leading them to a championship in 81, and then, of course, the Keith Smart shot in 87. Calbert Chaney was a classic player in the 90s and the run to the championship game, the runner-up in 2002. Yes, the recent success has not been great, but when you look at the program as a whole, over the life of college basketball, they still deserve to be there. Okay, two more programs to go on this list. Again, this is in no particular order. Kansas. Kansas, more than likely, if I were to order this, would be in the top three. But as of right now, I'm just listing them out. And Kansas has four national championships, the most recent in 2022, just two years ago. They also won in 2008 Mario Chalmers hitting a shot to tie the game to send it to overtime. Danny Manning in 1988, and then they also had a title in 1952. Again, Bill Self has this program. It's hard to imagine this team not getting a number one seed in recent years. Every year it seems like Kansas is a number one seed, and every year it seems like they are advancing into the second weekend and either winning and going to the Final Four or becoming very close to making it to the Final Four. Kansas is a program that, again, I don't see going anywhere. And when Bill Self decides to retire, whenever that might be, they're going to be going after another big coach, and their domination will continue. Finally, two more teams on this list. Uh, Villanova. Villanova is a team now that has three national championships. In 1985, 2016 on the Chris Jenkins buzzer beater, and then one of the best teams in the last 10 years in 2018. Villanova under Jay Wright was dominant. They've been a program that continues to be relevant year in and year out. And even though Jay Wright is gone now, this is a team in the Big East that is going to compete for national championships almost every year. Uh, I think they're a program that deserves to be a blue blood and really the last 10 years or so under Jay Wright is what got them there. And then finally, I would put Michigan State in there. Uh, Judd Heathcote winning a championship in 1979. Tom Izzo more recently in 2000. 
They've won two national championships. Magic Johnson, Mateen Cleaves in 2000, multiple Final Fours throughout the 2000s and the 2010s. Tom Izzo has this program playing at a high level every single year. And it's a program that even after Izzo leaves, I think they're continue going to continue to be consistent and be right there with the rest of the Blue Bloods. Okay, so that's my list of Blue Bloods. I have nine teams on that list. All of those teams, man, they make up the cream of the crop when it comes to college basketball. Um, I love watching all those teams play. Watch, watch, love watching all those teams coached. And, you know, more than likely, some of those teams are going to be in national title contention again this year. So that's my list of Blue Bloods. I'd love to hear from you if you have any Blue Bloods on your list that I did not put on my list. There, there could be some. Uh, but as of right now, those are the teams that I see as the best um, all time in college basketball. Well, I want to thank you all for listening to the first Full 40 podcast with me as the host, Ben Billman. I look forward to coming with, uh, coming at you every week to give you the updates on what's going on in the world of college basketball and what you have to look forward to as we get closer to March Madness. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.